So we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone. There's not an official or particularly special introduction, so we're gonna launch right in, which kind of creates its own introduction, but thank you for, for being here. All right, let me get you over here. Let me put your participant stuff away. And then good. All right. Six months. So picture this. I'm in the car cruising on I-95 heading north to Orlando. And that's where I've been staying for the past 10 days. In the car next to me is, or in the yeah, in the passenger seat is Simon. I'm going to show you a picture of me and Simon so you can see who I'm talking about. Can everyone see my screen? See a picture of a beautiful woman? Okay, yeah, that's that's Simon. So she's sitting next to me in the car, and we were just leaving a weekend-long leadership development seminar in South Florida, and I had flown across the country from Southern California to be at this particular one. Now, what you want to know is, in this moment, I'm feeling bold, but at the same time, just a little nervous, because what I'm about to do is something I have never, ever done before. And so, you know, I, in my head, I'm thinking to myself, well, I've only known Saima, you know, for a couple of months, and we've only known each other in person for 10 days. This is nuts. This is nuts. I'm not doing, I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't do this. I can do this. I'm doing this. So like I said, we're in the car and um, I'm holding the wheel very firmly at 10 and two. And I'm pretending to be vigilant about the road conditions ahead, just staring like that. And my heart is just beating out of my chest. And so with that determined stare, I look over, I declare out loud, six months, six months. Yeah, you see, Simon, I don't actually want to be in a long distance relationship. So um, here's the deal. You and I will date cross country for six months and every other week we're going to see each other. So I'm going to fly to Cal, you know, I'm going to fly to Florida and you're going to fly to California and we'll meet in the middle wherever we're going to see each other every other week for six months and in those six months, you're going to fly to California one last time, help me pack the rest of my things. We're going to drive back across the country to Florida, and then I'm moving in. And you know what? That's exactly what happened. We dated cross country for six months. We saw each other every other week like clockwork. These are some pictures from that happening. And then I moved in December of 2019, and then uh, we got married about uh, 13 months later. And... Um, yeah, we got married about 13 months later. So that's that's exactly what happened. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I didn't know then, but Simon has since told me. In that moment in the car, Simon finally felt loved the way she'd always wanted to be loved. And this was her childhood dream. This was a dream of hers. And it had finally come true. I made her dream come true. Now, this is not a love seminar. This is a lunch and learn about leadership. So why am I sharing this with you? Well, my name is Danny Hadas. And for as long as I can remember, all I've ever cared about is making other people's dreams come true. As architects, as people, you have dreams too. Raise your hand if you've got dreams. Yes, I can see you, by the way. So yeah, raise your hand. Very good. Raise your hand if you got dreams. Good. Dreams about what? Dreams about the impact that you want to make. Who here has got a dream about the impact they want to make? Yeah. Uh-huh. You can if, if you have to give me a head nod, that's fine too. But if you want some exercise, raise it nice and high. Very good. Very there you go. There you go, Ellie. It's good. <laughs> so then also as architects, as people, you've got dreams about the kind of lifestyle you want to have. Who's got dreams about the lifestyle they want to have? Yeah, of course. Of course. Now, for many of us, the dreams we have are tightly mingled with our work. Does that describe you? Your dreams are tightly mingled with your work? Yes, of course it does. Now, today, my intention is to help you get a little closer to those dreams of impact and lifestyle. But before we get there, there are a few things about me that I want you to know uh, before we get started. So personally, what you want to know is I was born and raised in New York. So whether it's today or anytime after today, you can count on me to give it to you straight. And yes, I do live in Florida now. If you weren't aware... It's every New Yorker's birthright to make their transition to Florida at some point. And I made my transition a lot earlier than most do. So that's how, that, that's how I ended up here. Uh, it's a birthright of mine. Now, professionally, uh, what you want to know is I've spent more than, well, now 15 years consulting with some of the biggest brands in the world. 
Disney, BMW, AT&T, recently Omni Hotels. They all partner with me to work on their biggest ambitions. But in addition to working with those big brands, I've spent the last four years working exclusively with small business owners and leaders in all, all sorts of businesses, architects included. On what? On getting their dreams back on track, helping them with their leadership. Now today, again, my intention is to take a step towards getting your dreams back on track so or closer to your dreams. So over the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm going to share with you four minimalist leadership practices that have the power to transform your leadership and your team. How many people here leading a team of others? Leading a team? Great. So for the hands that I can see, that's everyone. Great. Uh, so, and how many of you are responsible for a bottom line? Okay, got it. All right. So for those of you who are responsible for a bottom line, it's going to have a big impact on that too. So whether you, you know, if you're on the call and you want a leadership role or you're working at a manager at a firm, or if you're leading your own firm, these minimalist leadership practices are going to serve you in a big way. And my promise to you is we're going to cover each minimalist leadership practice with enough detail. So when you leave here today, you can use it. You don't need anything else. You don't need to buy some program or some course or some guide. You'll walk out ready to work with these practices. All right. That's my promise to you. Um, and I'm going to share stories with you to make the examples real. Now, the stories I share with you are not necessarily architectural firm examples, but I will invite you to consider leadership is leadership. It doesn't matter what you do or how you, it doesn't matter what you do. It matters how you lead. And that's the same in every industry, I promise you, because I've seen it. All right. So map those on to you, even though they're not going to be architectural examples today. Um, so if all that sounds good to you, I want you to show me how to use the chat and write sounds good in the chat. Sounds great. Even better. Love that. Thanks, Abigail. Sounds good. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. We are chat experts. Very good. Thank you, Catherine. Good. All right. Um, by the way, the best way to view today is going to be in speaker view. And then when I start sharing, it's going to show my face and the stuff on the screen. And that's going to be nice and easy. So don't get distracted by everyone else's shiny smiles and all that. Uh, the other thing you should know is at the end, we're going to have a Q&A. And I'll stay as long as there are questions. I can stay until 1.30. So if you have questions and you want to chat, we can do that. All right. So let's get started with our first minimalist leadership practice. I'm going to share my screen again. Everyone can see my screen? All right. Last thing. If I'm looking here, I'm looking at your faces. I'm looking at here, I'm trying to make them as much of a connection as I can, given that we're on Zoom. And if I'm looking over here, uh, it's because it's well, actually going to move the chat over here. So you're going to see me look this way and this way and this way. And if I'm looking over here, it's because I want to make sure I'm showing you the right thing on my screen. OK, so that's where my eyes were going, just so you know. All right, good. So first minimalist leadership practice we're going to talk about is a mindset. Now, this specific mindset, get this, this specific mindset is the take on the relationship between your team and your results. Now we've got a lot of team leaders here. So how many have had the thought, uh, the people on my team, my employees, they're in my way. Fess up if you've ever had that thought. They're in my way. They're in my way of me performing, getting what I want. No, no honest takers here. Right. It's like, no, I never had that thought. Okay. <laughs> Rebecca's like, who thinks that? That's crazy talk. No one thinks that. Well, it is a common thought. I've heard it a thousand times, if not more. For many of us, our people our coworkers, our employees, they can seem like they're getting in the way of our results and causing drama or the problems we experience in our daily work. You know, we think things like, man, if only they'd show up with the same passion I do. If only they'd finally learn how to do their job correctly. If only they'd listen to how I do things. Well, then my troubles would disappear and the results I was dreaming of would show up. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody? Uh -uh, I see grins, like reluctant grins. There we go. Well, so look, that's the kind of mindset that can cause a lot of trouble. Here's the truth. The people we work with, especially the people we, that we manage, they're not our obstacles to success. They never were. They never will be. They're actually the conduit to, us, to our success. So I want to make that real for you with a true story that I think illustrates it nicely. So Peter owns and operates a premium AV business uh, in Florida. And early in our work together, he, he went on the phone. He says to me, you know, Danny, before I hired all these people to work on my team, I was making revenues twice as much as I make now. I've got more overhead and I've got half the production. What's going on? I'm totally stuck. What do I do? So I answered his question with a question. I asked him, Peter, let me ask you something. If you had the business of your dreams, how would you want your team to feel? 
Well, if I had the business of my dreams, Danny, I would want my people to feel cared for. I'd want them to feel appreciated. You know what? I'd even want them to feel loved. Peter, that's really inspiring. Thanks for sharing. You know, right now you don't have the business of your dreams. So my question is this, what have you done lately to have your team feel cared for, appreciated, or loved? And then there was silence. And when he finally spoke, there was recognition in his voice. And he said to me, not a damn thing. You know, I surveyed Peter's team and on a scale of negative 100 to positive 100, his team rated the company a negative 40 when asked if they'd recommend it as a great place to work to their family and friends. His revenues really were less now than when he was working on his own. The thing is growing his team was the only path to his dreams coming true, but his team wasn't getting it done no matter who was on it. And that's because it wasn't about who played on Peter's team. It was about how the team was feeling and how the team was feeling was discouraged, overwhelmed, and micromanaged. Coincidentally, Peter's biggest complaints about his team before seeing these results were that his team was lazy. They didn't know what they were doing and they never listened to him. Now I get it, all you leaders, you're taught to focus on performance, on results, on profits, the bottom line, it's what we measure. The problem is, and I think this will resonate with you, is we're not exactly taught how to create those profits, the results, the performance. So my question is this, where does performance come from? Is it your drafting skills? Is it the software you use, whether it's AutoCAD or Vectorworks? Is it the contractors you work with? Is it any number of those? Is it all those things combined? Is it the way you manage everyone? What powers a company's or a team's performance? It's people. People power a team's performance. And their performance determines that bottom line, that profit. People power profit. Your people, the ones you're leading, they power your performance. They power that bottom line. They power your profit. So if you and I want to be, you know, if we want to go from being good managers to being extraordinary leaders, we must always hold this lens right in front of us. People power performance. People power profit. So what happens when you don't take on this mindset? Well, that's when you start to experience being stuck. You can see stagnations in your team's performance, or even worse, you can see declines. That's when you don't know what to do and you start to feel hopeless and powerless. And the truth is the moment you start operating through a lens that isn't people power profit, the moment you can say goodbye to your dreams, lifestyle impact. Now, I bet for some of you, this is a wake up call because you're like, Danny, I, this is new. I never thought about this. This is not something I think of and it's not how I operate. That's okay. Stay with me. I got you covered. People power profit. This frame of mind is going to transform your view of your people from being your obstacle to your conduit to success, the conduit to your dreams. And extraordinary leaders understand this and operate this way every single day they show up to work. People power profit is minimalist leadership practice number one, because maintaining this lens, this view, this frame of mind is a practice, just like meditation. And it's so powerful that it sets the foundation for the following three minimalist leadership practices we're going to cover. They are all about people. And why? Because people power profit. So if you want to leave this webinar ready to lead your team to new levels of success, you're going to have to lead your people. And the next three minimalist leadership practices will empower you to keep this mindset alive, which is why, minimal, uh, which is why people power profit is minimalist leadership practice number one. All right, so let's go on to number two, which is a team survey. How many of you are using team surveys with your teams? Some frequency. Rebecca's like, eh. All right, Abigail. All right, so we're not really sure. How many of you have tried them? You ever participated in a team survey? Okay, yes, you participated. Yep. Most of us have participated in surveys. Now, Abigail, since you said you did, you can show face, emoji, whatever. What's your experience? Were they useful? Was it a useful experience? You heard back about what everyone said and something was done about it? Oh, that's a surprise. <laughs> For most of us, Previous experience tells us that team surveys we take, they don't really do anything. They're not actionable. If they're worse, they're a complete waste of everyone's time. And if you haven't done surveys before, then you've stayed away because you realize they're not really a use of your time. So you just don't use them. But I have news for you. If you aren't using team surveys or if you're not using them effectively, 
then you're missing critical information about the experience your people have every single day. And their experience shapes their behavior, their attitudes, and their performance. You see, the people who work on your team have a perception of how things have been going. And sometimes that perception gets in the way of their growth. If it gets in the way of their growth, it's actually getting in the way of your growth as the leader. What kind of perceptions? Perceptions like, this is just how it is and nothing will ever change here. I'm not valued. My manager, you people, don't listen to me. Those perceptions. Now, I call those dream sinkers. They will stop you in your tracks until they're addressed. But you can't address what you don't know. And when you don't use an effective team survey, it can become nearly impossible to know about these kinds of sabotaging perceptions slowly deteriorating your team. So now I want to talk to you about Bridget Richard, who runs Lamplight Counseling in Ohio. Again, not an architectural firm, but leadership is leadership is leadership. And uh, she completed my three-month leadership momentum program. And there was a lot she could not address in her counseling business because she didn't know. Now, for years, she'd been bogged down by stagnation and lackluster performance from her 22-person team. Now, the first thing she didn't know was the answer to this question. What's holding my team back? Why aren't they doing what I need them to do? But she did know she needed to turn things around. So if you're in a situation today where you've got to turn things around with your team, then you need to launch that turnaround with a bold declaration. Something that says to your people, things are going to shift. You need something that touches everybody at once and has the capacity to rally them around a reinvigorated vision for growth, for success. Now, in all my years, there's only one tool I've seen accomplish this efficiently and effectively without a whole lot of time and effort on your part. And that is a team-wide survey. But I'm not talking about your run-of-the-mill employee engagement surveys. Those have their benefits. I'm not talking about that. And I'm definitely not talking about a bunch of questions you can answer uh, by scoring a, you know, a question on a scale of 0 to 10. I'm not talking about those. What I am talking about is a minimalist survey that's easy to launch manage and analyze. I'm talking about a survey with a set of very carefully crafted questions. Well, why is that? Well, because the right questions will provide you with really rich insight into what your people say is working, what's not working about your team, and what they would do about it if they were in your shoes. See, the right questions will give you an idea of your people's perceptions about leadership, about you, the overall working environment, the work they do, now, I call these kinds of surveys situation audits, because when they're done correctly, they provide valuable and actionable insight into the current situation on your team. Through the eyes of your people, by the way, you know, the ones responsible for powering your performance and your profit. Now, the information they provide will reveal to you what's holding them back, what's, what's stopping them from giving their best each and every day, which gives you what you need to create an immediate lift in performance. Now, Bridget's situation audit revealed that her team didn't feel like they knew her. Talk about what's holding you back. Now, I'm about to show you real quotes. She gave me permission to share real quotes from her situation audit. Uh, and I'm not going to read them to you. I'll let you read them to yourselves, but I'll just go through them one by one. So this is, these are real quotes from her own situation audit. Imagine that's what your people had to say about you. <laughs> Reading these makes me wonder what kind of mindset she was showing up with. I can tell you it was not people, power, profit. And without her situation audit, she'd have never known. Situation audits are really powerful, which is why they're minimalist leadership practice number two. First, your situation audit really does draw a line in the sand to tell your people that things are going to go different than they've ever gone. And it's like... Literally telling people, we're taking performance to a new level, and this is our first step. And what this also does is it shakes up any cynicism, any resignation festering within your teams and gives them something to be optimistic about. Now, next, your situation audit will give you a sense of direction. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. It applies to your teams at work, I promise. And the situation audit tells you where your team has been. So together, you can chart the path forward. Now, probably the most important benefit of a situation audit is it communicates several things to your people. It tells them that they matter. It tells them that they're important. And it tells them they are valued. 
you remember Peter that I was telling you about before, the premium AV business. We did a situation on it and we discovered his team felt discouraged, overwhelmed, and micromanaged. And Peter had no idea. These are not the emotions you want your team to feel. You want to elevate your team's performance. No, you want your people to feel invested, inspired, maybe even excited. But what's holding them back from feeling that way? If you do your situation audit correctly, you will find out. So I promise you built to walk away, be able to take action. So how do you launch your very own highly effective and highly informative situation audit? Well, there are only four things you need. I'm going to cover them quickly in the interest of time, but you'll have what you need. So first, you need the right questions. If you want to take a screenshot of this, take it. These are the exact questions I use with all of my clients. So you need the right questions. You need the right tool. I always recommend Google Forms. Why? It's free. It's easy to use. It's robust. And you can get a survey up in five minutes or less, and it'll be awesome. That's why. You need the right timeline. I don't think you need any more than eight days. Launch it on a Friday. Close it the next Friday. Spend a day analyzing the results, and you're ready to go. But also, you should know that a situation audit is not a build it, and they will come phenomenon. You got to tell people what's going on. Hey, we're launching this situation audit. It's really important you participate and share your feedback. Why? Because we want to take, you know, elevate our team's performance and can't do that without your feedback. If you don't tell people how, what, where, and why, don't count on anyone participating. So a situation audit is the first step I take with all of my clients and it always sets them up for success. That's because when it's done right, it can be the jumping off point for your team, or if you own a business here, your own business, to reach new levels of performance. You learn what's holding your team back so you can address anything in the way of elevating, the, uh, elevating their performance. Now, when each person on your team's individual performance rises, your whole team's performance rises. Situation audits. Discover what's holding your team back. That's minimalist leadership practice number two. I forgot to say this at the beginning, but you're more than welcome to ask questions or, or say anything in the chat. If you even feel compelled to come off of mute and contribute, you can do that too. It's totally fine with me. Um, but if there's not something, we're gonna move on to minimal leadership practice number three, which is a one-on-one -on -one meeting. How many of you have one-on-one -on -one meetings with the people on your team? Yeah. How? Uh, well, we'll do that. Are they working out well for you? They're productive? Good, good. Well, I'm gonna share with you something to make them even more productive today. So I hope you get something out of that. Now, some people, and we've got some people who aren't on video, so I can't see. You can use your digital hand if you prefer, if you're not gonna be on video. Um, for some people, they've given up on one-on-one -on -one meetings. Things, you know, they say things like, well, I've tried them, they don't work. So, use emails, Teams, like Microsoft Teams, Slack, uh, or some other messaging tool to get out the word at once or message that way because picking up the phone is not something we do anymore. Now, in my view, sending an email or some form of group message, is sometimes it's easier than picking up the phone. I really do feel you on that. My question is, is it effective? Now, one of the things from that Bridget said to me uh, in our work together was, Danny, my team doesn't do the things I need them to do. It's leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. And that's what I need to scale. So I asked her, well, how do you engage with your team? Now, I know this doesn't apply to you because you all have team meetings. But she said, uh, I sent a monthly newsletter, which gets about a 50% open rate. That's what she told me. She interfaces her team with a monthly newsletter. And she gets that 50% open rate on these very important communications that she puts her time and energy into. And of the people who opened the email, she had no way of telling whether they read it. So this is what I told Bridget, and I want you to know the same thing. When you passively communicate with your people about the things you want, you don't create the space for conversation. Without conversation, you don't know if your people understand what you're asking for. You don't even know if they're willing to do what you're asking. Between now and your next monthly newsletter, you don't have any insight in how things are going. You don't know how anyone's performing towards what you created. So for each one of you on the call with us today, your dreams won't ever come true if you don't know what your people are doing to make them come true. When I say dreams, I also, you know, project deadlines, whatever you got going on. Things won't happen unless you know what people are doing to make them happen. If you don't know what's going on with your people, 
then you don't know what's going on with your business or your team. Now, when I was growing up, I used to wake up early on the weekend to watch infomercials about the famous Ronco rotisserie oven. Personally, I was dazzled by the promise made by the host who said, just set it and forget it. Now, here's a secret. For some of us, that's how we engage our people. Set it and forget it. You know, you bring someone on board on the team, you tell them what their job is, and you send them off. And what happens when you set it and forget it with your team, with your employees? You get a whole lot of uncertainty. You get a whole lot of uncertainty. Passive communication, like newsletters, emails, Slack messages, teams, those are like set it and forget it. And when you set it and forget it with your people, you get a whole lot of uncertainty. And it's not just passive communication. Some of us on the call might be thinking, well, I have team meetings and I'm empowering my people because I don't micromanage them. And instead, we leave them to do their job and wait for them to check in when they have questions. Then, then what happens is you sweat up and down because you tell them to check in with you, but they never check in with you. And you never know what's going on. You're just wondering, what's going on? What's going on? They never check in with me. Do they like me? They like me. They don't like me. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on with their work. What's going on? So all you're left to do is assume everything is well. You remember what they say about assuming? Autonomy without guidance is another form of set it and forget it. It too will leave you with a whole lot of uncertainty. So for each of you, I want you to take a second and look at your team. Look at your own team. Where are you setting it and forgetting it with them? Where do you expect them to just get something done, but it's never done right? Where do you not know what's going on? Well, when was the last time you said, hey, can you get this thing done? Yeah, I'll get this thing done, but you didn't get a timeline, a deadline, or how you'll know when it's complete. So think about that for a second. Reflect, write that down. Make yourself a little note. Who do you have to follow up with? Because you don't know where something stands. That's where you're setting it and forgetting it. If you want to share in the chat, you can be brave and share in the chat, and you don't have to. <laughs> now, here is what you want to know. You can't afford to set it and forget it with your team. Now, why? Because people power profit. Minimal leadership practice number one. If you forget about your people, then you've got no one to power your bottom line. No one to power your performance. So if passive communication like emails and newsletters and autonomy without guidance don't work, what does work? Well, for those of you who have one-on-one -on -one meetings, I applaud you, but it's active communication, conversation. So I present to you for your consideration the minimalist approach to one-on-one -on -one meetings that have the power to transform your doers into leaders you can count on. I call this the 30-30. 30 minutes once every 30 days with each member of your team. Minimalist leadership for maximum results. Now you could spend these 30 minutes talking about the weather, sports, or whatever you want, but I wouldn't recommend it. Those are the kinds of one-on-ones that will be a waste of your time. So the truth is that there are three things that you've got to address in these 30 minutes to make sure your one-on-ones make a difference for you, the person you're meeting with, and your bottom line. So the first thing you want to talk about is from their experience, what's working and what's not working about their role or their experience on your team or their experience with you. What's working and what's not working about their role, their work, their experience with you or anyone else on the team. Now, you're all team leaders here. You may think, well, when they tell me what's not working, I should really take care of it and fix it for them. No, do not fix it for them. That leaves them being doers. So what you want to do instead is ask them, what do you see, Mr. Person or my team, what do you see to do about the things you said are not working? What do you see to do about that? Not you as the leader, you're coaching them now. What do you see to do about what's not working? And then you'll talk about what they want to accomplish before you meet with them in 30 days. So between now and then, what do you want to get done? A lot of actions will be generated from your second line of conversation, what they see to do about what's not working. But if, if they miss anything or things aren't not working, then you can go straight to that. I, my dog just walked in this room, so I need to close this door. I'll be right there. I'm so sorry for that. That's never happened during one of these. The door usually closes just fine. Thank you for your patience and your grace with that. <laughs> so we've got three topics, 30 minutes, once a month. Now, if you're committed to being a leader, and you must be because you're here during your very, very precious lunch. Evan, nice to see you. That's a cool office. Um, 
If you're committed to being a leader, then you can carve out 30 minutes at most once a day to meet with the people who power your performance, who power your profit. So look, whether you don't meet with your people one-on-one -on -one today, meet with them sporadically, even if you're someone who meets with your team consistently, if you follow this minimalist leadership practice, you'll have a chance to transform your doers into leaders. And then you'll be a leader of leaders instead of a leader of doers. So imagine that. If you were a leader of leaders, how might that shake things up for your team? How might that elevate performance? And that's 3030s. So now I want to talk about our fourth and final minimalist leadership practice, which is team meetings. Now, how many of you have team meetings? Mm -hmm. In the chat, or if you want to come off mute, how often do you have them? And for how long? Weekly for an hour. Weekly for an hour. Thank you, Abigail. Weekly for 15 minutes. Weekly 15 minutes, two times a week, hour each. Good. We got variety here. I'm going to knock your socks off of some stuff. Good. Weekly for an hour also. Weekly for an hour. Okay. That's the, that's the most popular one. All right. And, and iPhone says often. I don't know who you are, iPhone. Uh, iPhone says iPhone is your name, but, but often I got that. Um, Daniel, that's a good name. I would know. Uh, <laughs> so anyone here have anything that's not working about your team meetings? Something's not working about your team meetings. Like you get crickets or people aren't participatory, anything like that? We noticed that if our meetings were an hour and they were every week, that um, it was too much for people. We took them yeah. down to 15 minutes. We get participation. They get what they need. They move on. Got it. Yeah. And then, you know, there's sometimes there are really bad meetings where, you know, someone's being, someone's, so one person's dominating the meeting and you get crickets. Uh, now, it sounds like you're all having team meetings. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad you are. Because if you don't have team meetings, if you don't have team meetings, there are some things that, you know, some things start to happen. Well, the first thing that happens when you don't have team meetings is your people begin to feel isolated. And they begin to feel like they're on their own. They don't know what's going on with the team. They're not meeting with anybody. And then they start to feel disconnected from your mission and what part they play in bringing that mission to life. And as a result, they start to wonder if they can find something more communal elsewhere. Human beings are pack animals. We need to be part of a herd. So you don't want the people powering your performance, powering your profit, daydreaming about what it'd be like to work elsewhere. So you got to create an environment that fosters collaboration teamwork, and camaraderie. You need the individual leaders that you will end up forging in your 30-30s, your one-on-one -on -one meetings, to operate as a group of leaders. A group of leaders is a team you can count on to have your back. So if you're someone on today's call who doesn't use team meetings, or if you have them sporadically, if you're having them multiple times a week or every other week, I'm about to share with you the minimalist approach to team meetings that require minimal effort on your part and do achieve maximum results for your team. Now, the first question I'm always asked is, well, Danny, how often should I be having meetings? And the answer that I tell everyone is, once a month for one hour. Once a month for one hour. So that'll be different from what a lot of you are doing. Once a month for one hour. Because look, one team meeting once a month is all you need to create a sense of collaboration, teamwork, and camaraderie. One team meeting once a month is all you need to keep your people connected to how your business is performing and why your business exists, why your team matters. One team meeting once a month is all you need for your people to see why their role matters. Well, so how do you accomplish all that in one meeting once a month? Well, I'm going to share with you how Melissa and Simon do it at their wellness center. And as I do, I'm going to incorporate, um, I'm going to highlight the specific elements you should incorporate in your future monthly team meetings. And as I highlight these meeting elements, I really want you to imagine what it would be like if you left your next team meeting super energized and lit up knowing that the time you spent just helped your people feel connected to and inspired by you and everyone else there and what you're all doing together as a team of architects. So first things first, whether you're meeting over Zoom or in person, you want to welcome everybody. And you want to jump right in to your team's mission and your values. How many of you are business owners on the line? You own your own business? Okay. Yeah. So whether you have a team or you have your own business, you want to talk about 
the company's mission and values. You want to get everyone connected to that. Now, the way Melissa and Simon do it at their practices, they have everyone read aloud a portion of their branding elements that resonates with them. Now, whether you do that or you do it some other way, you really got to get connected to why you're there because it reconnects everyone to why they're doing what they're doing and why are they doing it with you. Architectural firms are not in short order. There are a lot of them. They exist everywhere. They can go work somewhere else. So why are they working with you? Why are they on your team? Why are they your firm? So you start each of your meetings by reconnecting to your vision, your mission, or your values. If you don't have those branding elements, you really want to get to work on them right away. I'm not talking about some pretty piece of paper on the wall you can look at and say, well, this is why we exist. No, no, no. The truth is proper and effective values can be used to measure someone's performance and their fit within your company or your team. You can literally determine someone's future by seeing if they align with your values. That's how powerful they are when they're done correctly. I could spend a whole hour talking about that, and I'm not going to do that. So once you reconnect the brand, you want to dive into numbers, team performance. That's element number two. Now, for most of the time, is wellness center. That means appointments booked, service hours sold versus service hours available, and revenue generated. And when a goal is met or exceeded, they share a reward with the entire team in celebration. So take a second and think about this. What would it be like if every member of your team was inspired by the opportunity to elevate their performance because they could clearly see and experience the benefit to them and the entire team, or in Rebecca's case, the entire firm? Now, to be inspired by that opportunity, they need to be clear about what they're working towards, and that's the numbers. So for each of you, what numbers do you pay attention to when it comes to performance? Share it in the chat or come off mute if you want, but what numbers do you have to pay attention to for your team? What's important? How are you measured? How are you measuring your team as a leader? If you don't know how you're measuring your team, well, that's a place to start. How do you measure your team's performance? Give another second here. If you don't put in the chat, percent billable, right? How often are you working on client work? Sure. Feel free to throw it in the chat or at least get present to it for yourself. How do you measure team's performance? Sure, project revenue for sure. So that's the second thing. Did we meet the deadline? Yeah. Did we actually do what we said we would do on time? So anyway, that's the second thing you want to cover in your team meetings. How are we performing? Now, after reviewing performance, what most and Simon do is they celebrate victories, they discuss challenges, and they share upcoming goals. Now, they start with what they call team brags. And that's when everyone on the team gets a chance to celebrate a work something they're especially proud of. Now, it can be about themselves or about anyone else on the team. Now, this is really important because celebration, recognition, and gratitude are three really powerful emotions that are connected to you know, sustained levels of high performance. In fact, it was Dale Carnegie who wrote in his world famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, be hearty with your approbation and lavish with your praise. Another way to say this, a simpler way to say this, is celebrate, recognize, and express gratitude with your team for your team as often as you authentically can and give them the space to do the same. Now that's the victories piece, which their business calls team brags. But what I encourage you to do is once you share about the vision, mission, and values. And once you talk about the numbers, start celebrating some people. Start celebrating some performance. That gets people listening. Oh, what's everyone doing? Especially in a competitive environment. Now, after that celebration piece, everyone's given an opportunity to share any challenges they want support with, as well as their goals for the next month. Now, this is really important because while one person is sharing, everyone else on the team starts thinking about how they can contribute to having that person overcome that challenge or meet that goal. And that right there is the foundation of team engagement. What you get is a meeting where everyone is tuned in and contributing every single time. So you can say goodbye to crickets when you ask for participation, and you can say goodbye to meetings dominated by one person sharing. So the question I have for you, it's, it's a rhetorical question, you can write it down for yourself, but what would be possible if everyone on your team was tuned in and listening for how they could contribute to one another's challenges and goals. That's the third element of a minimalist monthly team meeting. 
sharing victories, challenges, and goals. And the final element of a team meeting is important updates, relevant happenings around your business or around your team. So for Melissa and Simon, they recently moved physical locations so they'd share about the move and what was going on and what was needed and things like that. The point is you want to share about you know, important updates and acknowledge anything that could be on the minds of the people on your team. I think the last few years have given us a lot of examples of what could be on people's minds distracting us. You as a leader, you don't want to ignore these things because your people are going to want to hear from you. They're going to hear from your company about what, what are we doing about this? What's going on? What's our position about this? And that's not just when there's national news events like COVID-19. These can be events happening within your company, like someone moving on or other types of work-related events. And by the way, it's also a really great opportunity to recognize people for something that's happening outside of work. Also, you know, it was 2010. I still remember we were in a team meeting and a colleague, I was just about to do my very first triathlon. And a colleague said to me uh, with this, he always spoke in this ridiculous New York accent. He was not even from New York, but he always spoke in this ridiculous New York accent. He said to me, uh, Danny, I want you to swim like a fish, bike like Lance, run like the wind and say hello to the finish line. And that's from 13 years ago. Team meetings, you can celebrate anything. And again, you've got to address what you know will be on your people's mind and acknowledge what's going on because doing that demonstrates leadership on your part and allows your people to have peace of mind. And peace of mind allows people to focus and focus is critical for more performance. And that's the minimalist approach to maximizing your team meetings. So if you're on the call and you don't have team meetings, or if you have them inconsistently, or if you're having them very regularly, if you implement meetings with this structure once a month, it'll transform the individual leaders you create from your 3030s into a group of leaders you can cut, you know, focused on your team's mission and what you're up to, your dreams. So these are your four minimalist leadership practices. And when you do them correctly and consistently, these minimalist leadership practices can transform your team, your leadership, and your bottom line. They're so effective, they can double your team's performance without doubling your effort. Now, when I met Bridget, that counselor I was telling you about, when I met her, she had unfulfilled dreams about the impact she wanted to make and the lifestyle she wanted to have. She didn't know about any of these minimalist leadership practices and her team didn't know her. So we began with a situation audit. We took on the mindset of people power profit. We installed 3030s and we held our first ever monthly team meeting. She'd been in business seven years, never had a team meeting. Now we worked together in 2021. And in that year, Bridget tripled her take home pay. She moved both of her locations into bigger and nicer spaces. She had created plans to open a third. She added 10 new team members. And the best thing of all is that right around Q4, she sends me an email. This is after we'd stopped working together. We were together about seven months. And she sends me an email. She goes, Danny, um, you know, last year my business was at 600,000 and we've now cleared 1.2 million for the year. And uh, I'm definitely going to make six figures this year. She was making $20,000 a year. She literally doubled her revenue and cut her effort in half. She went from set it and forget it to wild success as a minimalist leader. She went from my dream will never come true to my dream is happening right now. Well, that's her success story, but she's not here and we're not talking about her. So let's talk about your future success story and what could get in the way. And the most common barrier here all the time is, well, Danny, I don't know how to get these things going in my team or in my situation, or I don't have the time, or Danny, I forgot what we talked about the next day. That happens. So for those of you here, raise your hand if you've been to a seminar or a webinar before. Yeah. How many of you took notes today? Uh-huh. Now I know this because I attend webinars and seminars and I take you know, notes too. And you took good notes, right? They're good notes. Now I know and you know that when you go back to work after this and you look at your notes tomorrow, those good notes will be good for nothing. Because you won't remember what was the context? What was I talking about? What was this thing I was writing? I can't even read my own handwriting. What? Yeah, a lot of times we take good notes and those good notes are good for nothing the next day and we go back to look at them. We go back to reference them. And I'm always asked, all right, Danny, well, do you have an easy way for me to ensure I get the most from today so my good notes aren't good for nothing? 
course I do. Yeah, so I don't want your good notes to be good for nothing. You've spent uh, at this point 50 minutes with me during your lunch. And that really means something to me. So I don't want your good notes to be good for nothing. I want to make them good for something. And to do that, I encourage you to meet with me after this talk. I will meet with you privately so we can get these things going in your situation. This is a free, no pitch zone type of meeting where you tell me what's going on with you. I give you whatever coaching and then you take actions and that's it. No strings attached. Every single person who meets with me gets, well, doesn't get closer. They overcome whatever obstacles they came to the call with. I was just doing this with two other people late last week who came to a, uh, a session just like this. So I really, it's like my gift back to you for spending time with me. And I would love to, you know, for you to take me up on that. If you want to do that, um, then it's really simple. Uh, you just, you just um, take your phone out and you open up your camera app and you put it over that QR code, press the button. If you give me your name and your email address, I will email you so you can schedule time to chat with me. And again, my promise to you is that, oh, sorry, mouse problems. If you come to the call ready to share what's not working as well as you'd like it to in your situation, and I promise you will leave that call with actions to take that elevate your situation quickly. That's what you get in that call. No sale, no pitch. It's not what we're doing here. All right, I want to be clear about that. All right, so that's how you would do that. If you don't have a camera on your phone or it's not working, then you can just go to the URL down below, which is bit.ly forward slash roadmap with Danny and um, enter your name, your email address, put your phone number if you want. I will email you after this with a link to schedule time to talk and we'll do it like that. Got it. All right. So uh, I want to wrap up with the final story and then we'll open up the Q&A. Going back to around 2019, I had a lot of friends telling me, Danny, you've got these big dreams. You want to have your own business. You want to have a family. You don't even have a girlfriend, dude. You want to have a family. You want to have a business. You want to have a house. You got to go to the seminar. It's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. You got to do it. It's a lot of time, but you got to do it. They promise transformation. It'll make all your dreams come true. I was pretty arrogant. I said, oh, you know who I am. I worked with Disney, BMW, AT. I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need that. It's not for me. I don't need that. I don't need it. They persisted. They persisted. They persisted. And I resisted. I resisted. I resisted. But I finally caved and I registered for this thing and I went. And I'll tell you what. Everything they said was absolutely right. Uh, a week after I left that seminar, BMW called and said, hey, we'd like to do some work with you. They became my first private client. And then three weeks after the seminar, I was introduced to Saima. And you know how that worked out. And I'm Zooming to you from my very first home that I'm living in. This is my home office. I bought it in October. Uh, and uh, my son is going to be 15 months old this month. Literally all of my dreams have come true from doing something I resisted. You know, I think in all of our lives, there are times where we're given some counsel. We're given some good advice. And we're like, yeah, you know, that sounds like good advice. It's not for me, though. But if I've learned anything, it's this. Sometimes it's doing the things we resist the most that make the biggest difference. So I want you to pick the thing from today that you're resisting the most, including possibly meeting with me. And I want you to take that thing and get everything you've got. Because if you do, then maybe, just maybe, your dreams will come true too. And thank you so much for being with me today. And with that, I want to open it up to your questions, comments. You can come off of mute. You can put it in the chat. And I'll give everyone just a few moments to get brave and come off of mute. And if you don't, I've got tons of questions people usually ask that I can share with you. I'm curious about the survey. Yeah. Um, how effective do you feel that is? As Highly far effective. As getting, as getting responses. So Emily, for me and, and what I've done, I've never had less than a 95% response rate. Never. Now look, the deal is you can't just send it and expect people to take it. You actually have to send it and then start tapping people. Hey, did you take that survey yet? Like when, when people take the survey, they have to respond saying, hey, I've completed it. It's anonymous. So your name's never attached to it. There's never a place to put the name in it. Um, but you, if people don't take it, it means they probably weren't followed up with enough. 
So you've got to actually, let's, let's say everyone here was on the team and you were the person responsible for making sure people take the survey and I was the one doing the survey for you. I would say, all right, Emily, uh, we've got, what is it? How many people we have here right now? I don't know, we've got 10 people. So we've got nine people who took the survey, one person's left. Who hasn't told you they completed the survey? Uh, Abigail never got back to me. Okay, let's tap Abigail on the shoulder. Abigail, when are you taking the survey? Oh, I'll, tell you, I'll take it today. It's like that. So you, you have to really work it. And that's the same with any survey effort. You got to really work it. So the responses from the survey versus having discussions one-on-one -on -one with folks. Uh, is there something that you're getting from the survey that you're not getting from the one-on-ones? The answer is probably, and most of the time, because people are sometimes not brave enough to have certain conversations live in person. So an anonymous survey, especially if you have a, how many, if you have a large, how, how big is your team, Emily? Um, 180. Yeah. See, so that'd be a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations to have. So a survey gives you all that information at once and allows you to analyze it and really create themes and trends from that information quickly. 180 conversations, even 30 minutes, that's a lot of time. So for you, uh, it just it allows you to scale. It, allows, it gives you scale and it gives you anonymity. And sometimes people feel a lot bolder behind the screen than they would in front of you. Yeah, great questions, Emily. Who else has a question or comment? And Emily, by all means, if you have another follow-up, you can go for it. One question I'm often asked is, well, what's the sequence of, of these practices? How do I start? And you want to start with a, I mean, you really want to start with that mindset, which really allows you to take on all the other things. My people power my performance, but you do want to start with a situation audit. You, you would start with that. And then you would go into the 30-30s. And after several 30-30s, I mean, maybe two rounds of 30-30s, you would start doing team meetings. Now, Emily, you have all 180 people and no other managers supporting you? No, no, no. Okay. All but right. I do, to a certain extent, um, connect. It, it is important to me to connect with folks um, yeah. because of the role I have. Um, otherwise, uh, if they don't... If they don't feel that connection, they don't elevate. It's true. That's that is absolutely true. Connection is one of the most three one of, one of the three most important pillars of leadership. You got to have, you got to know your situation. What are people feeling? How are they feeling? You got to have a connection with everybody, and then you need to understand accountability. And that's what that's what thirty thirties and team meetings are for to drive accountability. Um, but yeah, connection is super super important. Absolutely, Emily. Really cool that you know that you know that. Um, good on you. Other questions, comments, things you want to share, things you want to see, a slide you want me to go back to, anything like that. Going once, going twice, soul to the sounds of silence. Was this relevant to you and what you're doing? You can say no. <laughs> okay, great. All right, well, you know, um, I'm happy to stay for anyone who wants to chat about anything. Uh, if you don't want to chat or you don't have time, by all means, uh, don't feel like you have to stay. That is, the, that is definitely what we plan on covering today. Uh, and I really thank you all for your time. And I hope I didn't check, but I hope I get to see a bunch of you uh, afterwards for, for chats to see what's going on in your situation. Thank you.